Hello, hello, everybody. Well, we're still making videos. I think it's going well. So, welcome. Um, this is the first in a series that I anticipate will just last forever because it is about Beauty and the Beast retellings. And I, just a little bit of background before we like get into the first video. So I'm a huge, huge Beauty and the Beast fan. Um, I think a lot of us probably are. Give a Girl a Library, which is like low key the title of this series that I just made up like five minutes ago and I really like it. Um, and you know, she will love you forever, right? So um, I was, I'm aging myself here, but it says it like in my Goodreads, how old I am. So I'm 30. And in December 1991, which is the year I was born, that is when the animated Disney classic came out. And for the longest time, and then I had some, you know, some, some movies kind of intermingling there for a while. For the longest time, Belle was my absolute favorite Disney princess, um, my favorite character. I loved her story. And she was just everything I ever wanted to be. And I have, so I had this poetry collection that I wrote, which maybe I'll, one day I'll get into it. Um, I'm sort of anonymous. So I, I do this thing where I like, don't plug my computer in. But anyway, um, and in this collection that I wrote, I have a kind of an essay about, um, about why I love Beauty and the Beast retellings so much. Uh, but in summary, really, the main reasons I love them, so we've got, obviously, this idea of not judging a book by its cover, that traditional beauty isn't everything, which is, I think, important. Um, you've also got this idea of finding a place to belong. Um, Belle doesn't really feel like she belongs in, in this town, and... Um, People think she's strange, she's weird. Yes, she's beautiful, but also she thinks weird. She can read books without pictures. Crazy. Um, and she stands up for herself. And her father is strange, and and she accepts him for who he is. And she's also patient. She's willing to take the time to get to know someone. Um, we can talk about Stockholm Syndrome all we want to when we talk about being the beast retellings um, and whether or not that's valid. I do think it, it can be problematic depending on the retelling. But I love that story. And I love retellings of that story for a lot of the same reasons, but also because it allows the author to take some of those elements that may be problematic and shift them. It allows them to be creative with the elements that they do choose to include. Some of the original or some of the um, retellings stick very closely to the original narrative. Uh, some of them shy further away, but it's always there at the core, right? This idea of someone who's maybe considered to be quite beautiful um, versus someone who is um, maybe less so and how you find common ground and what perceptions perceptions of beauty really mean. And I'm not sure I'm doing a great job describing it because I'm recording this like probably when I should be sleeping, but I just had to talk about it. So that's, that's why we're doing this series. Um, and my plan really is um, a couple times a month to talk about one book and just kind of give you a background information on the book, um, maybe some of my opinions on the writing, on the author, and try not to spoil you too much. I um, I struggle with spoiling. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I will try to not do that, but I really do struggle because I just love spoilers. <laughs> I love telling stories. Uh, it's probably why I'm making these videos because I can tell stories and you don't have to watch them. I hope you do, but at least I get to talk, which is like my favorite thing ever. So today's book is called Cruel Beauty by Rosamund Hodge and it came out in, when did this come out? 
2014, actually. Gosh, is that... That's crazy how long ago that was. That was eight years ago. I mean, there we go. So this book, let's talk about it. So this book is kind of, it is fantasy. I mean, a lot of these Beauty and Beast retellings that we'll talk about are obviously going to be fantasy, but there are also Beauty and the Beast retellings in contemporary romances, in um, adult versus YA. Um, there are ones in historical, uh, historical romance. And in fact, I just gave one to a friend today that I had two copies of. Um, so they're really common. And I think we all love at least aspects of this trope, I guess you could say. Um, although uh, that's sort of an oversimplification. But um, Cruel Beauty is the debut novel, I believe, of Rosamund Hodge. And I, uh, to date, have only read two of her books. It has been um, hit or miss for me. And so I have struggled <laughs> to read any of her other books at this point. But this one is wonderful. Is it flawless? No. No, it's not. And in fact, I almost talked about a different one. Uh, but I just love this one so much, and I think it has flown under the radar, and I think it's worth taking a look at. So this book is technically YA, I believe, but I'll be honest, it doesn't give off super hardcore YA vibes. Um, no, it's not like super smutty, unfortunately, sorry. Um, some of the ones that we'll talk about definitely are, but a lot of them, because I come from a YA background, um as an English teacher, a lot of them will be YA, but I don't think that's a negative thing. Um, some will be historical, some will be um, more adult fantasy. Um, some of them will be more clearly Beauty and Beast than others. So I don't want that to deter you from not reading this um, or to deter you from reading it just because it is a YA book. Um, it's kind of fade to blacky, so if you if you want the smutty scenes, it's not going to be in here. But there are other reasons to read a book, right? Right. Okay. So what's this about? So the character names in this are a downside. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, so we have Nyx. And Nyx is, I don't know what how old she is when we start this, but she's a teenager, maybe an older teenager. And Nyx has been training since she was a child to basically break a curse. Uh, they're, they're not calling it a curse, um, but essentially, however many years ago, maybe a couple hundred years, um, their world changed and they were cut off from the rest of the world, cut off from the sun and the sky, and there is this artificial dome that exists over where they live. It could be a city. I think it's a larger, larger area of land. Okay. So there's a bunch of people there. Um, and there's a false sky, false sun, all that stuff. And that happened with the arrival of this character that they call the Dark Lord, I believe. I should have looked that up before I, I'm pretty sure it's the Dark Lord. Um, and we find out his name later. And he's kind of a... Um, Almost like, like Rumpelstiltskin slash, like, I don't know, like Lucifer type, um, because he will make deals with you and you'll get what you want, but also with a twist. And so, um, Nix's father, when, um, he and his wife wanted to have kids, they couldn't. Uh, I think they had fertility issues. And so um, he makes a deal with the Dark Lord and his wife gets pregnant. She has twins, Nyx and her younger sister, whose name I unfortunately do not recall at this moment. And after the birth of the twins, his wife dies. And from that point, he holds a pretty strong grudge. Um, I wouldn't say he deserved what happened to him. He's also not that great of a person. So whatever, you know, you'll see. And so he's been training Nyx uh, to be able to 
basically dethrone the Dark Lord and bring their world back and restore it. And it's not through some sort of assassination. Um, she hasn't been training hardcore with weapons or anything like that. Um, instead, there is something that they call... Let's see here. It doesn't actually say on the back, and I probably should know. But it's kind of like magic and science. And her father teaches her how to recognize like the hearts of things. Um, these mechanical systems. That's a good way of explaining it. And how to break them. And so the only way... Um, to do this is for her to be in proximity with the Dark Lord. And so I believe she's being married to him. And I'll be honest with you, I can't remember the reason why. It could have been a part of the bargain with her fought with her fought between her father and the Dark Lord. I can't remember. Um, I've read it several times, but you know, of course I just picked up the book and just started filming. So um so she's gonna marry him and then her job is to go through and investigate and figure out why he's there and basically destroy him through breaking um, these mechanical like mechanisms um, within the castle because that's what the scientists and her father um, think is happening. And I know that kind of sounds like whew, over your head, it makes sense when you're reading it. And also, like, you don't have to think too hard about it. This isn't, like, super hardcore fantasy. It's, like, 340 pages. So it's um, it's a pretty fast read. And so she marries him. Um, he's not there. Um, it's sort of like a marriage by proxy situation. And then she's dropped off by her father um, at the castle where the Dark Lord lives. And... Nyx is an interesting character. She um, loves her family. After her mother died, her father got with um, the mother's sister, the aunt, and it sort of became a hypocrite. Her younger sister has maintained an innocence that Nyx has never been able to have because she doesn't have, she's never, you know, she didn't have to marry the Dark Lord. She didn't have to train and learn all this stuff. Um, so she has this innocence that Nyx really wishes that she had. Um, and she's kind of pissed at her. She loves her, but she is angry that her sister doesn't seem to understand the burden that has been placed upon Nyx from her father. And so she has this um, really back and forth relationship with her sister because she knows at some point she's going to have to leave her. She hates her, but she loves her. Um, and Nyx feels like because she hates her so much sometimes, she hides that from her sister, but she feels like she's a terrible person. She feels like no one should really love her because she has this dark soul that has um, sort of been warping as she's gotten older and as she's continued to study and as she's continued to see her sister live a life that Nyx could only dream of and see her father happy with her aunt, not mourning the loss of her mother. And it's, it's, um, it's not dark necessarily, but she feels very much like she is not a good person. So she gets dropped off at the castle and he's not there. He doesn't show up. She's like, hey, where are you? What's up? And he's not there. And uh, her sister, before she left, gave her a knife. And she's like, hey, I can't take this. And her sister really, really wants her to. So she does. So she has a knife on her. And when, I believe when she, she falls asleep and she wakes up and he's sort of like draped over her. Um, like a big cat almost. It's it's interesting. Um, and she tries to kill him. Epic, epic fail. He finds it humorous. So you know immediately, I, I mean, the man has dark hair. 
Um, I think it like brushes against his shoulders. He's got like a black trench coat thing going on, like maybe some period-esque clothes. He does have like some fucking scary ass cat eyes, but you know, we just vibe with it, okay? Because he is like sexy and he, like when he talks, he's like, I don't know. Like I just imagine this like sexy purr, holy shit. Anyway, and um, the downside here, besides the cat eye situation, is that his name is Ignifex. I know. God help us all. Um, just a terrible, terrible name. But we get over it, okay? Because he's attractive. And you know from the beginning of me saying it's a Beauty and the Beast, you're telling that he is not really a bad guy. He's just misunderstood. And um, has secrets that he doesn't even know he has. So, tries to kill him. He finds it funny. And he's like, uh, don't try again, but whatever. I guess we'll see. And he's had several other wives in the past, and because it's been a long time, and um, they've all died, and so you're not quite sure the circumstances of their deaths and if he had anything to do with it. And he and Nix have dinner together, and he gives her the option to guess his name, and she can either guess it. Um, or she can choose not to. If she guesses incorrectly, he will die, I think, is what the thing is. And, um, and so she doesn't guess because she never knows. Um, and I like that aspect of this book because, see, I'm already at 16 minutes. It's crazy. Because in the original narrative, if you are familiar with the original Beauty and the Beast story, it is very different from the Beauty and the Beast uh, film from, from Disney. But the beast asks Belle to marry him every night and every night she says no. And so this is kind of that same thing where they have dinner together every night and every night he asks if she wants to guess his name and she says no. Um, but very quickly she begins to realize that things aren't as they seem. Um, he doesn't seem to have any real understanding of how he came to be there. He just was. Um, and she realizes he doesn't even know his own name, which is why he's asking. Because if she knows, that will help break this curse. Um, there's also another character in here named Shade. And she starts um, to develop a close connection to him as well. He, um, she can only see him at night. Um, he's almost like a ghost, uh, not quite. And in the day, he's invisible. And he looks, he is a spitting image of Ignifex, but sort of more human and uh, more broken, um, more compassionate, whereas Ignifex is maybe more harsh. And so, um, so anyway, she starts this investigation trying to figure out, okay, what is his real name? What's his connection to Shade? Because Shade is becoming a friend and maybe someone I'm interested in romantically. Um, so that's so one of my lights is like flashing off and on because it's telling me I'm up too late. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it's, it's interesting because she's trying to use the knowledge that her father has given her to look into the hearts of the palace and where they might be. Um, and there are several, and so shade starts helping her find them. But she's also realizing that Ignifex is not the demonic figure that she's been raised to believe, that he is not the reason that their world is the way that it is, um, and that he's not the one who's sending out these demon hordes to attack people. He's the one who's calling them back and trying to protect everybody. And that's all I'm going to say about it because I don't want to give you any spoilers, but this is an, a, a wonderful book. And it's romantic, Ignifex, even though his name is hella dumb, he is, oh my god, he's beautiful. Nyx is a little, maybe, maybe, maybe a little too self-loathing, but honestly, it works because she's not perfect. And there's not the traditional, she's not beautiful, people don't pay attention to her thing. It's more that she feels that way on the inside that she is not a good person. Um, 
And so this book explores really what it means to be a good person. How do you help people? How do you know you're doing the right thing? Um, you know, good and evil is about perspective a lot of the time. And it's just, there are some really, truly beautiful lines in this. I love it. And um, I've read it probably three or four times. The first time I read it, I gave it five stars. I've continued to give it five stars because of nostalgia. Um, I read it for the first time five years ago. It's probably a four-star book. The last 40 pages or so, the plot struggles with pacing. Prior to that, it does a very good job. But the last 40 pages do move a bit quickly. But it's just such an interesting spin on the Beauty and the Beast narrative that I have to recommend it. And if you've read it, I'd love to know what you think. If you've read more of her books, I'd love to know. I have read Crimson Bound by her. Not a fan. Not a fan. I will probably never talk about it. I have, I have an inside joke with a friend about that book because I hated it. Um, and so I just haven't read any of her other books, but this one I love dearly. So that's it. Let me know if you've read it. And let's... Actually, if you want to, in the comments, um, give me other Being the Beast retelling suggestions, feel free. Um, I'm just going to share about these every couple weeks. And uh, that way, if you are a Being the Beast retelling fan like me, you can read them.